What's up guys, and welcome to Five Stripe Weekly. This week, we break down that pretty nice comeback win against Montreal, and we discuss if Kevin Kratz is more than just a set piece specialist. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Stripe fam. I'm AJ, this is Tanner McLeod. Before we get into it, become a member of the Notification Squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button. So guys, let's get right into that 4-1 win against Montreal Impact at the Benz. Unfortunately, we started off not really that well. Uh, I mean, essentially, they came to smash and grab. Um, I, I thought we started pretty brightly, but uh, they got their goal and they sat back very, very early and just stifled us for most of the match until we were able to really technically do something different. Um, but, you know, they themselves uh, are pretty injury riddled. So they usually play with a five, but they played with a four with like numerous injuries to their back line. So uh, you know, they definitely came just to sit. Um, but I think eventually we were able to pull it out and make it another lopsided win at the Benz. Yeah, I mean, when you look at how Montreal set up, they set up, I mean, even from the get-go, the first five minutes of the game, they barely got a kick of the ball. Yeah. Um, Gressel whips in a pretty good cross. Keeper makes a good save. I mean... All that happens at the beginning, and then little slip up, and boom, they have their goal. The second they get their goal, you know what's going to happen for them. They're going to be incredibly tight at the back. Um, they sat with basically just two banks of four, and what was odd is for a lot of teams, they try to, you know, once you go into their half, they'll start pressing you. They sat back. They waited until they're like, all right, your center backs can keep the ball as long as they want. Mm -hmm. It was as soon as Atlanta tried to make that incisive pass inside mm -hmm. and move up. Once they got close to the 18-yard box, Montreal had pressed them, which was why the ball kept getting forced back to the outside, being recycled around, and then, heck with it, we're out of ideas, let's have a cross. Right. So, I thought they did very, very well, mm -hmm. you know, defending in the first half. I mean, because it does take a lot of teamwork and tactical discipline to yeah. defend that well. Mm -hmm. But then, after halftime, Tata just is like, well, I gotta go for it. Makes a very bold, but I thought a very smart sub, very taking serious. off Lorenowitz, because yeah. he's not doing anything. I mean, he's there to break up play when teams are attacking, and... Mm -hmm. Montreal, they had some attacks, and thankfully Brad Guzan made a great save in the second half to keep it at 1-0, but yeah. that was very rare that they actually did anything. I mean, first half was 77.8 possession or some crazy yeah. number like that. I mean, they saw nothing of the ball. And once you saw Atlanta get on the board and get those goals and Montreal open up, it was over. It was game over, mm -hmm. especially once Kevin Kratz scores that first free kick. I mean, they have to attack now. And then you saw Miggy running at the defense, Joseph running at the defense, mm -hmm. Barco running at the defense, you know, Tito megging a guy's like soul out of his body, which I think is the second or third time he's done that this season. Right. And he like, you had have never scored after he's done that, which is just like good for the defender. Cause if you get megged and then the other team scores, yeah, it's Young. just, uh, I think your career might be over at that point. Yeah, yeah. you just hide yourself in shame. <laughs> right, indeed, indeed. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, when Tito came on, I think that's really that turning point because he came on as a second striker, Barco moved back, Miggy moved back with Nagby. Um, and I was a little worried, like, Nagby as our essentially uh, holding midfielder, but uh, it worked out uh, perfectly because he was able to hold that possession so so well that uh, you know uh, you know they really had no chances. I mean, no. And uh, and then when we brought on Kratz, exactly. That's uh, I think that's really when the game really changed and turned the tide to us uh, because you know his his passing percentage is just immaculate. It's yeah. just, holy crap. Uh, I mean, he leads the league in players who've had at least 100 passes. He has the highest passing percentage. I believe 93.7. Right. 93.6% or something like that, yeah. Something incredible. Yeah. Lorenowitz is also up there, by the way. Right. And he's that's made a with, lot a, more. with a, at least 100 passes. But yeah, yeah Lorenowitz has like 300 passes and he's at 90 something percent. So, uh, I mean, granted, this, you know, this stat is uh, for, I mean, most of the people on this list are holding midfielders mm -hmm. or uh, guys that touch are, the ball pretty much every time their right. team has possession yeah they're uh they're pivots they're basically yeah they're uh you know they're passing a, a little bit more sideways a lot of times too so it's you know they're, they're safe passes but there are also mm -hmm. incisive passes as well like uh like kevin Kratz yeah well, well, but i mean but, not it's not what's, what's interesting is 
I think Tata was just spot on. And I think sometimes he has issues with substitutions, I think. Maybe yeah. he waits too long, mm -hmm. plays his guys too long, or he doesn't need to make them at all. Yeah. He was spot on. Bringing Kratz on, Montreal were fouling Atlanta a lot. Yeah. Like, they were doing everything they could to waste time. Oh, for sure. And when you bring on a player of Kratz's quality, especially on dead balls, it's like, yeah. I mean, once he gets that ball, he's confident going in. Oh. Parkhurst said as much. That everyone felt that exactly. that ball was going to go in. And of course, he hits it perfectly, mm -hmm. and it goes in. And it's like, it's not really shocking. I don't even think for us as fans, I think we kind of had a gut feel. Like, okay, if he's over the ball, we mm -hmm. know he's going to put a good ball in. Yeah. And that's an incredible, like, thing to have. I mean... Yeah, to, to be able to put two in in a game, um, yeah. It, there's, uh, there's a stat out there that also says, um, you know, he's one of the very few... Five uh, players, yeah, five players along with Jovinko that have uh, put two free kicks in in one match. Uh, but he also he did this as a sub, so yeah. that's like the delineation. He's, he was on for yeah. right about thirty minutes, if yeah. not less. Yeah, so amazing that he's able to. I mean, the first one, okay, it's like yeah, we figured. But the second one, to be able to put the second one in and fool the keeper two times from that deep, yeah. I think uh, amazing, amazing. I'm glad stuff. the keeper looks stupid. That guy pissed me off all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, he wasted an inordinate amount of time. That's true. The, I mean, the, it the took, yellow was It took 30 yeah. minutes for the ref to say, hey, kick the ball after 25 seconds. Uh -huh. And then it took him an hour to actually book the guy. And it's like, dude. He was doing it from like the He fifth was minute. wasting time <laughs> from the very beginning. Exactly. I'm like, you get six seconds. Yeah. Kick the. And he, I mean, at one point in time, the supporter section was counting. Like, this dude for was sure. taking an extraordinary yeah, amount of time. And yeah. it's like, Look, there's time wasting, and then there's that. It's exactly. like, good and lord. Let's, that's not even to talk about his hands. Um, yeah. Yeah, they, he, he was, uh, on balls that he should probably catch, he was parrying them away, or you know they uh, just would uh, bounce around. And it's just this, yeah. I don't know uh, if he regularly plays like that, or if he's just rattled at the bends, but I mean. He did make one good save at the beginning. I'll give him credit for that. Right. But, I, but I, yeah. at the end, I mean, to be fair, Montreal have the worst defense in the entire league. Like, yeah. They've shipped Their goal goals. Pretty, it's, pretty they've shipped going more in. goals than anyone else. Right. And I mean, it's like, that's nine goals in two weeks that they've just that they've yeah. given up. It's like, yeah. they're not very good at the back. So It was I'm negative not, eight, I think, going in. And then now with uh, the yeah. minus so, three, so negative 11 mm -hmm. goal difference. And it's only it's eight it. games into the season. Yeah. That's not a good look <laughs> over a whole season. But I mean... Right. I'm, I'm glad that it that United, I mean, I was confident of a win. I thought it was going to be 5-0. Yeah. 4-1, I mean, still a big win. Not Definitely. at all the way that I thought it was going to go. Yeah. But, you know, I, I thought Atlanta would get a goal earlier. And by Montreal getting that goal, it kind of changed the whole outlook of that game. Right. And, you know, if Atlanta scores an early goal, which they do quite often, mm -hmm. that game's completely different. Because That's then true. Montreal has to play for... Yeah. 80, 80 minutes and it's like you could see as soon as that team had to open up it was just like who's yeah. gonna score floodgates exactly uh, and I think that's uh, a really good um, showing from us to come back from a goal down where we haven't really been put in that position at the bends very much if at all and so uh, you know for us to show that kind of grit uh, to you know it, obviously it was frustrating for a lot of fans to Watch the first 70 minutes, essentially. Uh, Is that? I think it might only be the third time Atlanta United have actually conceded first at the Benz. I think so, behind yeah. Behind Orlando, Orlando and Minnesota. Yeah. So, you I know. Think, yeah. And we've come back every single time. So, you know, we, we definitely do. have that, uh, you know, the fans backing the team, I think, definitely really, really helps yeah. them. Um, but in terms of uh the montreal like their their impact in this game huh? um it's you know it was very very low after we uh you know we uh, we tied it essentially uh the game was ours i mean yeah. it, it i mean was immediately apparent after that the house fell down as soon as you kicked the door in. exactly mean, yeah <laughs> they just weren't very i mean they're just not very good i mean yeah the thing is, I think as fans, we're going to have to get used to a lot of teams coming in and setting up like that. Columbus yep. did it in the playoffs last mm -hmm. year. I mean, teams tried to do that. It's just, mm -hmm. it's incredible how key first goals are for Atlanta United, especially at home. Mm -hmm. Because if Atlanta score first, the other teams have to try to play. Mm -hmm. If other teams have to try to play, 
they're gonna get smoked almost right. every single time. Right. I mean, with the exception of the best teams, a la NYCFC or something along mm -hmm. that. Yeah. But I mean, even then, I think you could see that in the next game against Portland, they were exhausted. I mean, <laughs> coming to the bins is a very draining, difficult task for teams. Mm -hmm. Especially the bad ones. So. Yeah, and we're you know like uh, NYCFC, they're a little older, so they had to run the full size of that pitch. I mean, yeah, who, who wouldn't be tired after uh, you know you chasing know, Miggy around? Yeah, for chasing Miggy around. Minutes. Yeah, and then uh, especially Barco coming on after that, and they're yeah. So that's that's that match. Uh, but this match uh, against Impact, I mean, um, you know, for the floodgates to open. And for it to get that lopsided, it's another case of uh, you know the the scoreline flattering what we did. But I think at what point though do you stop saying that? Yeah, because it's like it's yeah, true. maybe maybe it is flattering, or maybe Atlanta is just a team that mm -hmm. all right they might struggle for a while, but once they find that third fourth gear that many teams don't have, mm -hmm. they can put a lot of goals on you very right. quickly. So it's like you make mistakes, Atlanta is going to capitalize on right. them. I mean, uh, for instance, you know you have. Uh, the LAFC game. Yep. I mean, that game ends up 5-0, and it's yep. like you have, what, three goals scored after the 80th minute? Exactly. You had two goals scored after that point in this mm -hmm. game. I mean, it's like you, you had the Romario Williams basically goal against LAFC scored at the death. Mm -hmm. Kratz's goal this past week scored at the death. Mm -hmm. Miggy's goal against the Galaxy scored at the very end of the game. So it's like mm -hmm. this team can score goals, especially at the end of the game. So. Right. I like that because, okay, maybe we didn't play great, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're the ones that are putting all those goals away. Right. So at what point in time is it flattering to us or is it teams just can't play a full 90 minutes against United I think that's because what it is. they just get absolutely exhausted and then yeah. once Atlanta gets those openings, mm -hmm. they we're, punish teams. Yeah, we're, we're clinical definitely at the, you know, at the death of games. And uh, I think it's because also the depth of our team um, and also that you know we're not gonna stop trying to score on you um, which is a very very good thing for not just goal differential but for the kind of killer mentality that we should have as a team um, and especially back to the depth it's you know when you have a person like Tito that you can bring on at the end of games to run at your defense that's just a scary prospect uh, at any time in the match but especially at the end when you're just fatigued you don't have any more uh, you know running to give that's cool oh. um, and Good especially job. yeah exactly uh, or you know so it really starts to um, you know if our strength in our depth is going to be uh, something I think across the you know across the season is going to be shown, uh, especially in a kind of three games in a week thing that we have coming up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's something that we really questioned at the beginning of the season. We, you know, we need to sign a central defender. We need to sign a you know a central midfielder, and then all of a sudden it's like Kratz stepping up, McCann yeah. stepping up, Gressel's a right back apparently. Who knew? <laughs> And it's just like, you have all of these guys that are coming together and it's like, wow, okay, maybe not. This team is deep. And I think a lot of that credit has to go to Tata because mm -hmm. some of these guys didn't play that much last season mm -hmm. or now they're playing in new positions and he has them confident. He has them working it as a team. And it's like, a lot of that credit has to go to the manager because if you don't have a manager that can both man manage and coach and get his tactics right, mm -hmm. it's like, that that's what you need to be successful in Atlanta are just so incredibly lucky to have a coach of you know Tata's just ability and I mean he in my opinion was the MVP for this game this past week because yeah. he saw a problem he addressed it he changed things and Atlanta put four goals up in yeah. the second half yeah because it's very inoffen that he actually makes a sub so early mm -hmm. you know not even to say at halftime um, you know, so a guy who probably we would say almost to a point, uh, sometimes he's a little averse to making a sub, mm -hmm. uh, to make that such aggressive, uh, you know, substitution. Um, yeah, I think he's adapting. He's seeing, uh, you know, what it takes to win in this league. Yeah, I think that's, I think I haven't really thought about it in that phrase, but I think that's absolutely correct. I think that not only are these players getting better, but Tata has now learned MLS, or he's yeah. figuring out how to play in MLS, which should be scary for them because he goes, okay, now I know I can do this in certain situations, right. or I can do that in certain situations, or I can, can afford to make formations this change. within the like, match. Yeah. Well, not a lot of teams can, easily and fluidly switch formations. Atlanta yeah. United easily switch between yeah. a three at the back and the 4-2-3-1 right. 
flawlessly. Yeah, we and saw Gressel playing a right wing back and as a number eight in the very same match and this switch back out like just, I mean, it was incredible. I mean, the yeah. second you saw them switch to a 4-3-3-1, though, Montreal had no idea what was going on. Right. Because you had them being pulled wide by Barco and Tito, mm -hmm. and they're like, okay, these guys are out wide. What's happening? Now, the fullbacks got isolated, and then you had Miggy having space in the middle all of a sudden. Like, all right, everything was like this for one second, and now it's different. Right. Had the ability to change tactically, that can really, really mess with teams because... Mm -hmm. Now players are in new positions that they're not used to, and you're tired, so you're not thinking. So you're like, oh, he has been, oh, he's over here now, and mm -hmm. that's incredible. And yeah. again, in MLS, not a lot of teams can do that. It all goes back to the manager. Indeed, indeed. And uh, so, in terms of uh, you know the the frustrating first half, let's talk about what the team was saying. Um, so essentially, Brad Guzan was saying. Uh, to the fact that we uh, were still having a lot of chances in the beginning, so we didn't get worried, we uh, didn't stress out. Um, so, you know, I think they really showed that, you know, they weren't trying to press themselves into having to score. Uh, they had a lot of patience, and I think that really bodes well for a long season when you're going to encounter a lot of teams that, uh, you know, that sit back for most of the game and stifle you for most of the match, that's the, the mindset that you need to have. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, is that this team is now so much more technically gifted on the ball. Because now you have right. players like Nagby, you have players like Barca. When you have players like this, you sign them in order to be able to break mm -hmm. down teams that just sit deep. Mm -hmm. Because Nagby can pick a pass. Barco can make three guys look foolish at one time. Right. And, and they have to foul him. And then, and then yeah, he draws a foul. And then you have a free kick. A free and kick, and yeah. then it's like you have players with the ability of Kevin Kratz. It's like, all right, you sure you want to do that? Yeah. So it's like, you know, they, they showed an ability to break down a team. Mind you, the first goal came from a penalty. But still, it's like yeah. they still drew the penalty because right. they put Montreal in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's... It's really impressive when you look at the talent that Atlanta has Absolutely. and how they've managed to acquire it, set it up, and mm -hmm. then tactically involve everyone. Right. And speaking of the uh, the penalty, it's uh, it's interesting who takes the penalty, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So apparently, you know, there was a, the the scenario was that Joseph handed the ball to Miggy uh, and told him, "You're taking it." Like uh, Tata gives. I, I think last year it was a, a rotation between. Uh, Assad, Martinez, and El Miron. Um, but and this year, I mean, you have Barco in there who took penalties at you know the Sud Americana final. Um, you know he got the winning penalty to to win the uh, the trophy for Independiente. Like he's used to taking penalties. He's on the pitch. He's not taking penalties. You know, it's there's this like competitive fire. I'm sure. With, yeah, uh, I mean, he looked a bit upset a bit at when he was realizing it was. I mean, yeah. I think part of it is he really wants to get his first goal. Yeah. But I think at the is. same time, it's like, Miggy's been making penalties. I yeah. mean, he's got what four goals or five goals off penalties? Four goals off penalties. Four goals. Yeah, four goals off. So penalties, it's like yeah. also he didn't go left. He went what? right. He went right, and the it keeper almost, and yeah. the keeper went right, which blows my mind. Yeah. Maybe he saw something in his run up, but it's just yeah. like. I was I was mind blown. But he bungled the uh, doesn't matter when it the save and, and so but that's uh, another case of his hands I think yes absolutely terrible hands I think that in but. that situation you go with your hot guy you go with yeah. what's been happening mm -hmm. Miggy's been hitting it well from the spot it's true and keepers have been struggling to save it I mean mm -hmm. he, he, as exampled by the goal and so it's just like I think maybe in a situation where you're not losing. Yeah. Where, you, where you don't have to get that goal. Right. Just because there's less pressure on him. Not that pressure even bothers Barco, because no. again, he made it in the Copa Sudamericana final. Yeah. So he does not care about pressure. But I think Barco wants to get that first goal. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if another one happens, yeah, you might see him step up and take it. But in that situation, yeah. I think it makes the most sense for Miggy to take it. He's mm -hmm. been the guy. He's your leader in a sense when it comes to that. So mm -hmm. respect the, the elder statesman in that scenario. And yeah. maybe it's frustrating, but that's, that's the way it is. I mean, it's hard for you, even if you're, I mean, look at Neymar. Neymar comes into PSG and he wants to take penalties and Cavani's like, no, I'm the penalty taker. Right. So it's like, sometimes you have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, eventually I think Barco will end up being on penalties because I think he's really good at them. Yeah. So, 
I'm not worried about it, it'll work itself out. I'm ready to see Barco get a goal though, so he probably just really wanted to get that first goal in a home game. And Tata Martino held so much importance to Brad Guzan's save at Montreal's second chance at goal in the match. He said, Montreal had a chance to score the second goal, but Brad saved it. So now looking back on the game, it's easy to say that everything turned out wonderful. The substitutions, the goals scored, but the part of the match that could have changed the game we don't talk about. The one-on-one -on -one that Brad saves gives us a chance in the match. After that is when we took over. Absolutely, yeah, that's a, that's a game changer of a save that, you know, we, we mentioned earlier, if he does not make that and we're two nil down at the Benz, I'm not sure that's happened before. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's even, that's a very tough situation, especially with the way that Montreal were playing. Mm -hmm. And I think at the time, I don't think anyone really realized how big of a save it was because it wasn't like he dived, it just kind of like hit him and then kind of went over. Well, it's like, I think he, you know, he had a really strong arm, right arm to parry it away because yeah. um, it was nearly point blank that mm -hmm. I mean the, I mean but in real time it's kind of hard to see it's like oh okay yeah. it's the save but then you mm -hmm. go back and you're like holy crap that was a really big moment yeah I think Tata just hits the nail on the head it's like mm -hmm. that could have really changed the game but mm -hmm. he's on doing what he does and makes a pretty really right. big save I think yeah the, the team has the trust in him that even if he is one-on-one -on -one, uh, with you know uh, opposing teams player yeah he's he's more often than not is he's gonna do the business mm -hmm. so um, you know, Brad Guzan, you know, kind of an unheralded uh, player in this match. I think he deserves a lot of plaudits for Absolutely. I mean, keeping us in Because at the end of the day, he's an incredibly reliable goalkeeper, especially yeah. at this level. Because most of the keepers you're seeing are like Montreal's. They, I mean, look at the LAFC yes. match. It goes straight at Fry's hands. And yeah. it's just like, all right, you know what? Let me just parry this into my own net. And it's just like... That happens a lot in mm -hmm. MLS, and to be able to have a keeper that you can rely on, that you know mm -hmm. doesn't do stupid stuff like that because mm -hmm. he's played at a very high level, is really reassuring and really nice to have. And again, it just goes back to just how deep this team is. Right, and you know, I think we have to mention those people that hated on uh, Guzan when we even first heard that he was coming into the team uh, last year. Man, so many people were. Uh, just ragging on, you know, how many goals he gave up against Chelsea or, Yeah, you know, he was like, playing for Middlesbrough and Aston yeah. Villa. What did you expect? <laughs> Both got relegated because they were terrible and it exactly. wasn't his fault. Yeah, the defense in front of him definitely had a part to play in all that. So I like, mean, yeah. and you got to think of the level he was playing at. If you make a mistake in the Premier League and yeah. you let world-class strikers through on goal, mm -hmm. they more often than not score almost every time. Right. So... Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. would you rather have Brad Hughes on or someone else that's like bang average MLS? So we got to talk about the man of the match for me, even though he was on the pitch for about 30 minutes. Uh, Kevin Kratz, man, uh, had a hell of a game. But our question is, is he more than just a set piece specialist? Because, well, you know, yes, he is money from a free kick, a direct free kick. Um, you know, he brings much more to that uh, in his game to LA United. I mean, he's a metronome in passing, and yeah. uh, he is able to play a bunch of positions for us as a 6, as an 8, as a 10, to be able to uh, really fill in anything we need later in the match. Yeah, I think he's actually turned into a incredibly strong midfielder for Atlanta United. He's able to come in and help control the game. Um, so he can do a number of jobs, but he's almost always going to be a midfielder that can come in for you and do a job in some way. Mm -hmm. If you need to control possession, he can do that. He can mm -hmm. move. He can have one and two touch passing and be very accurate with it. He can give you excellent delivery from set pieces. Mm -hmm. There's a lot he can do, and I think that it's, it's a blessing to have someone as talented as him. And it's frustrating probably for him because it's like you're not going to start over the people who are on the pitch because yeah. <laughs> they do a lot more. But at the same time, it's like you know that if someone gets hurt, you have someone that can step in mm -hmm. immediately and play a role and play it well. Yeah, and, and not a bad guy to bring on when, uh, you know, later on in the match when you need something, um, he's able to bring so many facets. And absolutely. also, yeah, like we were saying, those, uh, you know, three game match weeks, it's... Uh, yeah, know. and I mean, I, I think Atlanta should absolutely go for the U.S. Open Cup this year to get some, some, some silverware. And it's yeah. like, if you want to do that, you have to play other players. He is one of those players that can play. And he will be better than anyone else he's going against because a lot of teams don't play their full strength squad in the U.S. Open Cup. Mm -hmm. So it's like, 
there are players on that bench, him included, that you if, if they start, I'm not gonna be like, oh, dang, well, Kratz is, it's like, okay, Kratz is starting. We know what we're gonna get and it's gonna be good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's incredible that Delaney United have that. And I mean, right. you can see the confidence he has. Tata knew he was gonna score. The team knew he was gonna score. And to have that confidence from your teammates and to have that, that that brotherhood that you can see there, you can see how excited all of them are when that goal went in. And also, they kind of knew it was going, like, it's oh, right. it's amazing to see that. There's an incredible chemistry there between those players. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, people might get, uh, well, oh, Joseph must be a bad teammate because he looks like he, he only wants to score for himself. Yeah. Look how excited he was when, when Kratz yeah. scored. He, you can see how much he cares for his teammates. He hands the ball to Miggy, you're taking the penalty. Mm -hmm. He cares for his teammates, right. he's just really competitive. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, and the thing about Kevin Kratz is uh, he was, uh, I think he was a tryout for Minnesota United. Uh, he was yeah. on, uh, when they were a USL side of all things, uh, and he was on Philadelphia Union uh, the year before he joined Atlanta United. They also gave up on him. So, wow, man, that, that's just a yeah, missed they, opportunity they for missed both out of those teams. I mean, but it's also just a credit to his hard work that he's, yeah. He kept working at free kicks, like, I'm gonna be good at free kicks. Mm -hmm. And he worked on it constantly. Yeah. And the drive to keep staying with it. And, mm -hmm. you know, now I think he's absolutely got a place in this in this team and mm -hmm. he is a very key component coming off the bench. And who knows in the future, you know, how injuries or transfers work out, he could be a very key component of a starting 11 at some point in time. Mm -hmm. And with the way that he's playing, I have complete confidence in him to, to do it. Agreed, agreed. And so that brings us to our new segment where, you know, dude is money from uh, from the free kicks and the league has recognized that uh, they've chosen his first goal as a nominee for one of the MLS goals it's of the It's gonna week. win. Yeah, it's already at over 80%. Uh, I mean, you keep, you know, we gotta keep doing what we do and just bombing the polls, what we do. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's well-deserved against I mean, the other ones. <laughs> oh, so. look, Laurent Simon <laughs> scored a free kick. Oh that wait, he hit it bubble, right at the yeah. keeper. Oh, Kratz put one in the upper 90 and the exactly. keeper had no chance. Twice. Yeah. I think we know who should win that. Definitely. Mostly because one player is a dirty player and trash and I hate him, but the other <laughs> player is absolutely class and I love him. Indeed. And so, uh, you know, it's probably going to win. Uh, you know, it's probably already won by the time you watch this, depending on when you watch it. But And also an interesting thing to note in those Kevin Kratz free kicks, Tito Vijalba has a huge part to play in that when he's in the wall, in a space that's vacated, Kevin Kratz's ball goes through that hole. Um, that's pretty amazing. Like, uh, they've probably definitely worked on that. Uh, and because Tito Vijalba just pretty much runs away in that space, like, uh, it just creates this spot where, you know, the, the ball can just really just effortlessly uh, glide through. So, I think... Uh, you know, not just Kevin Kratz uh, deserves the uh, the applause there, but Tito uh, did his job, so kudos to him. Absolutely. And talking about players doing their jobs, Miguel Almiron, because uh, he's an MLS Team of the Week for the third straight week, <sighs> third and he's time. also MLS Player of the Week. Probably a good shot for Player of the Month as well, with five goals and two assists in the month of April. So not only has it been a good month for Atlanta United, it's been a very good month for Miggy, and I think... Mm -hmm. I remember some of us were concerned about his play in March, yeah. and I think it's all worked itself out. Right. He's also leading the league with Jose Martinez in six goals. So, I mean, you know, on top of that, uh, you know, he's leading the league in a bunch of stuff, I think, as well. So, uh, man is just doing bits. He's, uh, he's playing out of his mind, and may it continue, because... You know, uh, he's a guy that uh, is really driving this team, uh, you know, to the top of the standings, uh, at least in power rankings at the moment. Yes. Uh, Unfortunately, <laughs> New York won, and we yeah. still have a game in hand, so mm -hmm. Atlanta United win that game, and I believe that game will be the game against Sporting KC. Right. So win that game, and, you know, not drop any points, and you'll be there. But, I mean, it's mm -hmm. a tough month ahead. We'll it get is. into that here in a little bit. But um, also, it's been coming out over the last few days that Atlanta United not going to make any moves in the transfer market. Right. Which, uh, you know, it obviously we look like we needed some stuff. Uh, we needed some players in the team to help shore up some of the depth that we thought we maybe didn't have. But uh, I think a bunch of players have stepped up or also, you know, actually been utilized by Tata Martino 
to uh, to actually you know show really how much uh, depth we actually have. Um, so you know going into the season, we all thought, yeah, we need some more depth behind uh, Jeff Lorenowitz. Uh, I mean, granted, we still don't have a like for like for him, but we have more depth in different types of players that could do a job uh, if he were to be out for a period of time. Uh, knock on wood. So, um, you know, it, there's, you know, with this depth, uh, you know, especially with the front line, there's a bunch of players that aren't even getting into the first team, like a Brandon Vasquez, uh, who has to get, you know, a, like minutes off the bench at Atlanta United 2. That's just insane. That just tells you not only the quality of the first team, but also, you know, Atlanta United 2, the academy, this team has a lot of talent in it, which is both good for now and the present and also the future. Right. Yeah, and because LA United 2 is developing our uh, our squad and, uh, you know, kind of the fringe players are getting more minutes as well, like say uh, a Mikey Ambrose, uh, them getting 90 minutes, you know, at least uh, week in, week out, man, that, uh, that just bodes well for us in multiple competitions. But, uh, I mean, in terms of, you know, us not making a move before the transfer window ends. Like, are are you upset? No, not really. I mean, I know we were linked with Mbia there for a while, and, yeah. and that that didn't pan out. But it's like, I imagine for the money he wanted, he also probably wanted to play a lot. And who's he going to play ahead of her now? I mean, I guess yeah. he's a really good player, but it's like, mm -hmm. well, I'm not going to bench him for Kratz. I know what I'm getting out of Kratz. Like, right. I'm not going to bench him for anyone who's starting right now. Mm -hmm. So. I'm surprised. I was really concerned at the beginning of the season, but you know, with the way things are going, I think the mm -hmm. team is fine right now. Maybe they might have to worry about that closer to the end of the season if he was a player like Miggy or something in the summer. Mm -hmm. But I think right now, I think they're fine, and I think mm -hmm. they're just going to keep on chugging ahead and picking up points, hopefully. Right. Yeah. I mean, and there also was that uh, that rumor from Miggy's dad, who was saying, "Oh yeah, he's going to go after the World Cup." I don't know about that. Uh, they basically, the front office pretty much rebuffed that, and um, Tata Martino even said that, yeah, no, Miggy's staying till the end of the season. Um, whether that actually happens or not, we will see. Obviously, we don't want him to go, uh, at least until the end of the season, so he can at least, you know, you know, take us to uh, to the promised land and slash win an MVP. I'd love to see him lift an MLS Cup, and then he can absolutely go on his merry way and tear up some teams in Europe. Dude, dude. So, uh, you know, I think we'll, it's a definitely wait and see at the near the, you know, tail end of the season, but as of now, I'm not going to make any moves and we're okay with that. And guys, we have to talk about the Dragon Ball Z fusion thing that Miguel Miron and Jose Martinez did together. This is amazing. I, you know, I, I hope they got this on camera uh, and they did and it, it is as epic as I thought it was. Oh my God. I, I remember I saw like the end of it. I context. I grew up a massive Dragon Ball Z fan, as I imagine a lot of people around sure. my age are. Sure. And I saw them kind of do the thing at the end where they did that, and I was yeah. just like, "Did they just? Did, was was that? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was." And then they ended up, you know, tweeting out a picture. And I was like, "This is awesome!" Yeah, I was so, so happy. It was so cool. I nerded out on that. I thought it was incredible. And I was like, I don't know what compelled them to do that. Yeah. But it was awesome. I think it, it shows that uh, that soccer fans and soccer players uh, alike, they have maybe an affinity for just on the, the geekier side of things. Uh, especially even like, uh, say, an Infinity War or Avengers type stuff. Um, which, speaking of, we have a Joseph and... Shameless self-plug. Uh, yeah, shameless self-plug. But guys, check out this shirt. Support us by buying it from the link below. And yeah, I think it's pretty dope. So, you know, uh, geek stuff and soccer. Man, you I'm know. I'm down with it. For the win. I'm down for with the it. For the win. Absolutely. And guys, we have our injury update this week, which is no one. It's kind of awesome. I'm really behind that. Let's hope it stays that way for a while. But as of right now, everyone's fit. So good luck, Chicago. And moving on to Atlanta United 2, they also had a match on Saturday and they unfortunately lost 1-0 against Pittsburgh Riverhounds uh, to go away, you know, and, and lose. I mean, it's not the end of the world. They started brightly 
uh, to start the season with an undefeated streak, but to lose two games in a row, you know, it, it's tough, but I can't really say it's like, you know, uh, you're not really expecting results. At, yeah, it's, you know, it's development. They're, they're working hard, and honestly, them losing now is just going to strengthen their bond and, you know, mm -hmm. reinforce the fact that they hate losing. And when they get into yeah. the first, I mean, they're you know they're giving their all, but they're going against grown men, full professionals. Mm -hmm. We're playing a lot of young kids. Right. So it's like, yeah, it might be frustrating seeing the results, but they're probably gaining an incredible amount of knowledge and, you know, learning how to play the game so that when they do come into the first team, they're going to be ready and mm -hmm. they're going to they're going to be able to just step onto that stage and be confident. Right. So I think it's incredibly important and I'm really just, I can't be asked about the results. I, I really right. don't care. Yeah, I mean, I think it also helps them deal with adversity. So, you know, it's a, you know, the results don't really matter, so it's okay. Um, but I think one thing to really note is, in my opinion, these away kits, uh, which they pretty much uh, kind of unveiled for this match, are super clean. I really kind of like these. Uh, I think as a top, at least. Yeah. So, um, you know, with that uh, seven stripe, you know, kind of uh, side underneath the, the armpit, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, if they wanted to sell those or the Atlanta United 2 kit, uh, you know, they could. It's not gonna happen. I can tell you right now, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Sorry to break everyone's hearts, yeah. MLS will not let that happen. Yeah. So. It's sad days. Sad days because, but. you know, getting kits in Atlanta United is very difficult to do. And guys, for a quick update on the standings in the MLS, NYCFC unfortunately won their game, so they are back in first in the Eastern Conference with 20 points. However, Atlanta United have played one game less, and they are only one point back with a far superior goal difference. Well, it's only plus three, but let's be honest, we'll keep putting some goals on there. I've got faith in that. But the interesting thing is, is briefly, Saturday, for the first time in our history, we were top of the supporters' shield standings. Mm -hmm. So that's nice because I think we're going to be right around there to win it come into the season. So 19 points from eight games, not bad, not bad at all. Have a game in hand coming up. So guys, looking pretty good so far this season. So guys, we have a tough schedule coming up in May. It's against some tough teams that have played really, really well so far in this early part of the season but we have Chicago away, we have Kansas City at home, we have Orlando away, and we have uh, New York Red Bulls at home, and we have New York, our New England Revolution away. Uh, with those teams, uh, you know, what do you think the, uh, you know, how many points do you think we're gonna take out of those five matches this month? Um, I mean, it's kind of tough because that's that's five tough games. You're alternating between home and road. You have a midweek game, so you're playing three games in, in less than eight days. Mm -hmm. That's tough. Um, and only United is away from has been really good this season. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's like, you know that these teams are really good. You're getting into the meaty part of the schedule. And right. Orlando's done well. They've kind of overperformed. Yeah. They have also played the easiest schedule in MLS. They have, um, but, or they, ones there. but they're, they're still pretty legit. Uh, but it's in, a big game. Yeah. It's a, they're always gonna it's play a rivalry tough. game, yeah. and it's in Orlando. So mm -hmm. that match is going to be tough. Um, mm -hmm. It's 15 possible points. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy with nine. Mm -hmm. um, I think that... I don't. I don't. I, I took now when I was looking at it, not seeing losses. I took it as two yep. wins. I think they're going to be able to win the games at home against Sporting KC and against Red Bull. Mm -hmm. I'm just very confident in this team right now, playing at home, mm -hmm. um, especially with Barco starting, with Tito being fully fit. Mm -hmm. I think this team's playing better. Um, mm -hmm. I think that Chicago. They've actually. They're not great, but they've not been terrible over the last couple weeks. Right. Um, so I think that. I think they can pick up. You know, a win on the road. I think if they can start off with a win against Chicago, I'll feel a lot better going into the month. Yeah. Um, but I take a draw against Orlando, and they just didn't play well in New England last year. So I think they can beat New That's England. True. But honestly, you win your home games, you draw your away games, you win the league. So true. I'll, I'll, I'd be happy with nine points. Yeah, I think uh, I think I'm thinking somewhere around yeah nine or ten points. I think uh, the easiest games for us to win are probably. Red Bulls, uh, you know, I think the other other games are, are going to be very, very tough, though, because, yeah, I mean, they've started off so well, uh, and Orlando is on a five-game winning streak so far, um, but I think, yeah, you know, with winning at home and getting 
at least a point on the road. Um, that puts me, I think, about 10. I'd be comfortable, I think, with even, what, three wins? Let's see. Yeah, if we get three wins, maybe, yeah, so. Three wins, two points. draws, yeah. 11. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's, I, I mean, yeah. the thing is, is like, I don't, I, Part of me wants to still be reserved. I don't. Yeah. I don't want to be like, oh, well, they're gonna go through the whole month unbeaten. It's like yeah. eventually they're going to lose a game. Exactly. That's how it, it happens. happens. Yeah. And the thing is, in MLS, is 99 percent of the time you have no idea when that will be. Yeah. So it'll happen at some point. It'll be mm -hmm. annoying. Mm -hmm. I don't know when it will be, but yeah, I mean, nine, ten points. You're playing three away games. Yeah. Take a point from each of those games. You'll be happy with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it would be frustrating if we drop some points, but it's like right. so what everyone else around us. Right. Would it be detrimental to you if we if we drew every game this month? Yes. I would not take that right now. That's five points out of 15. You've dropped 10 points, and that yeah. I think that would drop us back in the standings. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that'll happen. I mean, even, I mean, yeah, Sporting KC, they're a really good team. I mean, I think that's a really big game and a, and a good measuring stick similar to NYCFC because they're the best yeah. team out west right now. Mm -hmm. Um, so you beat them, you put some distance between yourself and the best team out West, which could be important coming into the season. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, and Red Bull aren't terrible. They made the semifinals of the CONCACAF Champions League. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I, I'd like to see, I, I expect Atlanta United to win every home game they ever play. Mm -hmm. Every time they step onto the bins, I expect them to win. And I don't think that's unfair on them. They expect to win. I think they expect to win every game they play. Yeah. which is how confident they are right now. And with the way they've been playing, even on the road, this newfound defensive you know, solidity, mm -hmm. I can ex I'm can. i not expecting them to win, but I'm not fearful that they're gonna lose. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I would not be happy with five, with five draws. I, I, they, they need, I think three wins, nine points, I think is the minimum coming out of this month they need to have. And guys, it's that time of the month again where we recap our goals of the month and saves of the month. For you, what's your goal of the month? My goal of the month is James Brighton. Bet you weren't expecting what? that. U17s, but you probably know what goal it is because he said, I see yours, Laton, and I raise you <laughs> about 15 yards further back from right around the halfway line, chips it over the keeper. Well done, take a bow, son. The balls to do that at that level, that's mm -hmm. what gets you promoted up to Atlanta United too and gets you Definitely. playing in some bigger games. Well done, James Brighton. I tip my cap to thee. Really interesting one. Yeah, uh, I would have thought you would have chosen one of the Kevin Kratz goals. but Yes, uh, I would have, yeah. but those are awesome. I've seen him do that before. Seeing a guy yeah. in the academy score from the halfway line. That's, that's not true. something you see. The thing is, that's not the only academy goal that I thought about. Yeah. Because you also had both of those U13 goals, one oh, yeah. of which ended up on sports. And you had a chip uh -huh. from outside the box and a bicycle kick. So well done Atlanta United Academy because they're scoring some great goals. Yeah. Hopefully seeing those kids on the first team someday. Dude. Well, for me, I think uh, you know doing it against top level opposition, I think is the difference. And so Kevin Kratz's second free kick goal for me, uh, just the amount of bend he's able to put on that uh, and hit it off the post into the you know, that's just Keep it an even, like, dive. He moved one way and then realized, oh, I'm screwed. And you can't really fault him for it. I mean, again, fantastic goal. He made the keeper look silly, which is good, because I hated that keeper. But, man, I, I'm sorry. It's goal from the halfway line. So, but both are just great goals. Lots of great goals from Atlanta. And we haven't even talked about Romario's goal against LAFC. I mean, that yeah. was a fantastic goal as well. Yeah. He takes You're on half the now. team, and then he just zing, outside the box, weak foot. Perfect. So it was a good month for goals as far as Atlanta United are concerned. Absolutely. Uh, and so let's get on to our save of the month. Uh, what, you know, which one do you think for you? Uh, Guzan against Montreal. Definitely. I think it's, I agree. I mean, I don't think there were really many other matches that were like, okay, that needed to happen then. He played He played well against Galaxy, but Galaxy didn't really put much on target. Mm -hmm. That needed to be saved. He right. made the save. I can't really argue with anything other than that one. Yeah. I mean, this, uh, this is such a crucial point in the match where if we went down 2 nil. I mean, uh, it would have been a completely different story. We wouldn't be as happy as, uh, as we are. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Braguzan's save against Montreal Impact definitely gets our save of the month. And we saw a very interesting question posed on Twitter this week. Um, Matt Doyle, who is the armchair analyst for MLSsoccer.com, he uh, tweeted this out. He said, would a seven-figure transfer bid for Julian Gressel from a championship or two Bundesliga team at some point in time surprise anyone? Kids so good. Um, for me, 
Uh, I think it would surprise me right now. Um, I think Julian Gressel's played in at least three or four different positions in two different formations so far this season. He has played really, really well. Um, but for a team of, well, first off, I'm just going to go ahead and say my issue with that tweet is that he's comparing to Bundesliga and the championship, the English championship. Those leagues are not even close. Yeah. Um, the English league championship actually has more money than league on right now. It might surprise some people. Uh, Bundesliga 2 is not a very good league. Um, it's decent for a second division team, but the good clubs who are the bigger clubs who have their hats on straight mm -hmm. traditionally go down, dominate, come back up. I know someone will probably correct me on that, but I think that from my experience and having you know paid attention to both of them, the championship in England is, is a very good league. People do not need to take that away. It's a very tough league. Um, I don't think he's necessarily ready for that step just yet. Um, I think if he keeps performing at the level he is right now throughout this entire season, then maybe teams will have something to think about because they'll have a whole season of footage and of performances from him playing well. Um, seven figures, even though you see crazy you know, transfer sums thrown around, someone paying a seven figure fee for someone from MLS doesn't happen very often. Um, I would love to see that for him one day. I think right now he might be a couple years away from that. Um, if he keeps playing, again, like he's playing now, the team keeps playing at a high level for a few years, then yeah, he could earn that could earn that move. But for me right now, I think he's really just solidifying himself as a starter for this team because at the beginning of the season, we, we didn't think that would be his role. Yeah. And I think, right, yeah, I think right now, um, he's playing, he's, he's undroppable. He's turned himself into a right back, right wing back. Franco Escobar is looking on like, what do I do? Because he's playing incredible. Um, so I think I think it's a bit too soon to maybe have that conversation for him. And again, that's not a slight on Julian Gressel because he's playing really well. And also it's a bit jealous because I don't want him to go anywhere. So that leads us into our question of the day, which is, do you think Julian Gressel's good enough to earn himself a move to the English League Championship or to Bundesliga? Get down in the comments and let us know what you think. So guys, that's it for us today. Remember to subscribe if you haven't, smash a like, remember to share the video because it really, really helps us out. And for Tanner McLeod, I'm AJ. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh -huh.